Um, as many of you know, Brian's uh, taking the next couple weeks off and um, getting married next week as well. And so uh, I'm grateful uh, for him to be able to take some time off. And we're uh, grateful to have Yana here helping out um, during that time as well. So praise God for that. As uh, many of you know, uh, through the past year or so, we've been doing these different series on, hey, David and <laughs> Abigail, good to see you. We've been doing these different series on lessons from the Bible, right? So we were in Lessons from Acts, and earlier this year, we were in Lessons from Genesis. And so it's, you know, really good to be able to pull things out of Scripture and uh, be able to apply it uh, to our life, right? So it's life lessons from these different things. Um, but also there's a trap. There's a trap in those life lessons in that sometimes we could live those particular lessons. We could be treating people really nice or kindly, right? And then all of a sudden we're like, hey, we're in right standing with God. We're doing the right stuff. You know, I am, you know, God's chosen people because I'm doing these life lessons, right? And that's not what scripture ultimately teaches us, right? Uh, it ultimately teaches us that we're all sinners, we all make mistakes, we're all fallen and broken, and it's only by God's grace, right, uh, his grace and his mercy that we are in right standing with him, because we all make mistakes, and then because all people are made in the image of God, people do good things, right, um, even the people who don't follow God will do good things sometimes, right, and so I wanted to step back, and I briefly mentioned this last week, God bless you, Cindy. Um, I wanted to uh, just kind of take a step back and do a Bible overview this morning, right? It's important to, to you know, check ourselves, right, within the context of any series and, and, and lessons and preaching and, and say, hey, what does the entire, what, what's the overview of Scripture, right? What's the story of God and his interaction with humanity? So we're going to see, you know, um, we're going to cover the entire Scriptures this morning, right? And it'll be about two hours, so I hope you brought your lunch. You guys bring lunch? Bring some food for the baby, for a little man this morning? Because right, we're going to be here for a while, right? Now, we're going to have a Bible overview and um, just taking a look at some of the different themes within Scripture. And it was so hard preparing this message. Actually, this is a message I started preparing about a year ago. Right? I started preparing a year ago, and even... Uh, you know, coming into the past couple weeks of looking at, I kept on adding things and then taking out some scriptures and this and that so that it could all be within a manageable amount of time. So I have a, uh, another variation of this that we'll tackle um, at, at another point in time, right? But we want to do a Bible overview this morning. All right, let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that um, looking at scripture this morning and your story of interaction with, with us, with us human, fallen, broken people, Lord. We pray that uh, it will be encouraging, it'll be edifying, it'll put things into perspective on who you are, who we are, and how to live for you, how to follow you, how to worship you, how to um, uh, just continually repent and turn towards you in our life, oh Lord. Uh, so we pray uh, that our time together is edifying and this message as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So number one in scripture, we see that God is the creator of all things, right? God is the creator of all things. This is the story of God and humanity, right? And creation. He is the creator. Um, God did it all. He started it all. And we see this very in the very beginning of scripture, Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Psalm 19:1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands, right? In Romans chapter one, it says that no one is, uh, uh, no one has an excuse to deny God because just by looking at, the, uh, at nature itself, the glory and the majesty of nature, you cannot deny a creator, right? So the story of God, the overview of scripture is that God is the creator of all things, right? A foundational thing, right? Isaiah 45, 12 um, the Lord speaking to Isaiah says, it is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry host, right? So number one, God created everything, right? As we, we live life, we remember that. Next, we see in scripture, rebellion against God, right? We as people, as the created beings, what did we do, right? 
We rebel, just like children rebel against their parents, right? Disobey their parents. We disobey God and his order and his creation, right? Genesis 3, 6 says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it, right? The story of God and humanity is rebellion against God, right? Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, right? So here in Isaiah 53, right, is a, a, a foretelling of Christ, right? Um, God has put all of our iniquities on Christ who bore our sin on the cross, but it's telling us that all of us, right, like, ha- like sheep, have been led astray, right? Have been led astray from God. We all rebel against God. In Romans 3.23, a familiar text, uh, we often say is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, overview of Scripture is that we all have sinned and none of us are righteous by ourselves, right? A quote from Billy Graham is, sin is rebellion against God, right? Next, in Scripture, right, in this very, going through Genesis, uh, we see right away a prophecy of the coming Messiah, right? Genesis 3, 14 says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel, right? Um, uh, In hindsight, uh, saying, you know, talking about Jesus Christ and him bearing the, our sin on the cross, right? Um, and being uh, stri- stricken by the heel, the nail going through his heel as well. So one of the first prophecies or the first prophecy about the coming Messiah in Scripture, right? Next, in the overview of the Bible, we see God's judgment, right? In Genesis 6, uh, we see God's judgment um, when at the time of Noah. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth, right? So God destroyed everyone, right? And the earth except for Noah and his family, right? So we see God's judgment in Scripture, right? After God's judgment, we see, um, you know, uh, through Noah's line, right, uh, a, a promise to Abraham, right? God makes a promise to Abraham. Uh, first, he makes a promise to Noah to never destroy the earth again through a flood, right? And the rainbow is the sign of that promise. And then we see a promise to Abraham that he will make a great nation and will bless um, him out of the line of, of uh, Abraham. He said, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Right? God's promise to Abraham, a foundational part of Scripture, right, is uh, the, the promise to Abraham. Right? And we see later on that this promise to Abraham is affirmed and continually through text in the Old Testament and New um, that this promise to Abraham is through faith, right? Our righteousness comes through faith. Um, It was Abraham's faith that was credited to him to righteousness, right? Romans 4.13 says, it was not the law that Abraham, uh, it it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes by faith, right? That righteousness that comes by faith in God and Jesus Christ, right? So our righteousness comes through faith, right? Then later on down the line, from Noah to Abraham, then we see, um, you know, the Israelites being captive in Egypt, and we see salvation from the Lord, from slavery in Egypt in Exodus um, through Moses, And specifically, out of there, we see the Passover, right? Which is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, right? Exodus 12, 5 says, The animal you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. 
And then Exodus 12, 13 says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt, right? So in the Passover, we see a perfect lamb um, being sacrificed, right? And then the blood of that lamb uh, being put on their doors so that the judgment of God will pass over the people of Israel, right? Which is a foreshadowing to, to, to Christ, right? Coming out of Egypt when they're, uh, the people of God are, are freed from slavery, right? Uh, they're, they're brought forth, they're saved, right? And they're in the wilderness. We see that the law, right? The law was given to Moses in Exodus 20, right? And these, um, uh, you know, I, I, I like to often tell people, you know, uh, like Romans 1 says, everyone, we cannot deny God and a creator by the creation of, of, of the universe, right? By the natural things. And the same God who created these natural laws that allow us to live has also created moral laws that show us how to live, right? And in um, the Mosaic laws, there's over 300 Mosaic laws, right? And some of them are, are customary laws and then other are moral laws as well. And then the Ten Commandments coming out of these laws, um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with, is you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not have any graven images. You shall not misuse the Lord's name. You shall remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet. Right? Um, this Ten Commandments for the Lord. So we see God giving his people the law. Why does he give us the law? Because he loves us and he cares for us and he wants us to know how to live, right? He has given us the ability to live through nature and then he wants us to know how to live through his law. So then through the Old Testament, we see this recurring theme over and over, right? We see God's promises, right? To make a great nation um, through Abraham's line, through a line of faith, people who believe in God. And we see God's perfect law Right? Then we see people over and over again in the Old Testament being in rebellion, being in judgment, and then being saved when they turn and they repent from their evil ways and they turn towards God. Right? So this is a theme over and over again that we see in Scripture. And if any of us is honest, we see this in our own lives as well. Right? It's easy to go against God's ways. Right? And then we pay consequences for those things. And then ultimately, when we turn and we repent and we go to the Lord and we follow the Lord's ways, we are saved and we are blessed, right? And there's, uh, you know, so we have those things, uh, microcosms of those things happening on earth and then macro for eternity as well. So there's a continual theme in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament that we see in God's promises, his rebellion against his law, judgment and then salvation, right? And then throughout the Old Testament, we see over and over again, there's over 300 prophecies of the coming Messiah, right? Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, right? So we see over and over again in the Old Testament a foretelling of who the Messiah would be and that the Messiah is to come, right? Micah 5, 2 says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times, right? Again, a, a, a foreshadowing of Christ, the coming Messiah. And then Isaiah 9, 6, it says, for, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Right? So throughout the Old Testament, we see this rebellion, judgment, salvation, and a foretelling of the coming Messiah. Right? And all of a sudden, boom! God himself enters humanity. Right? God himself comes. The Savior comes. In the, in the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said 
through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? God's promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ, right? And then in Jesus Christ's life, we see a clarifying of the law, right? We were given these 300 plus laws, God's people, right? Uh, through Moses uh, was given these uh, 300 plus laws. God gave them to Moses. And then we start living out these laws, right? We start trying to follow these laws and we come up with other things, right? We come up with other things and, 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 and become, there's people who are legalistic and then there's people who don't follow the laws and, and, and all types of issues within the nation of Israel. So when Christ comes, when the Messiah comes, he clarifies the laws and he clarifies it in two ways, right? Orthodoxy, right, which is right belief, and then orthopraxy, which is right practice, right? So he gives uh, Christ himself, God himself in the flesh, gives us the right beliefs and the right practice, right? In uh, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, um, you know, is a, is a summarization of all the law when Jesus replied and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, right? Beautiful summary of the laws, right? Love God first and foremost, and then love others, right? I think um, uh, very often people have a desire to do this nowadays. One of the issues, though, is that Without following God's word and his ways, we don't know how to love people, right? If, if it is our perspective on how to love people, it might be very different. Some people spank their kids, right, in an act of love, and other people don't, right? And they say, oh, it's, it's unloving to spank your child, right? It's unloving to yell at people. I'm from New Jersey. We yell at people all the time, right? Right? Like, you know, it's... It, it, like there's so many different contextual things that uh, through our opinion or our perspective, we could continually flip or flop, right? And so to ultimately love God, to, to love God, we need to know what his commandments are, right? We, we need to know what his standard is. And then to love other people, we need to know what God's standards are and what God's law is, right? So that's what Jesus did. If, you, uh, if you've never, please read Matthew chapter 5 to, to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. That's the text that I read when I was 22 years old that made my sin so clearly revealed to me, right? And made me give my life to the Lord, right? So uh, in, in Jesus' teaching, right, he clarifies what is right belief and what is right practice. So often people think that we're aligned with God and we're, we're doing the things of God. We lie to ourselves to believe this, but we don't even know what scripture says, right? It's so easy to, to, to make up your own God, right? To have your own idol, your own practice, and be against, and, 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 and fool ourselves, right? And fool ourselves. Continually we see rebellion, right? Judgment, and hopefully uh, salvation, all right? And then in Jesus' teaching, too, he also clarifies our mission, right? He clarifies our purpose, um, which is to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I, w and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, right? So often um, a a as Christians, right? Uh, we, we fool ourselves into thinking our mission is something different here on earth, right? And it's not go forth. And then some people who really hold on to this text will go forth and just talk to people, tell them how they're wrong, tell them what they should be doing right, right? Like literally get on a pedestal and try to uh, talk down to other people. But here in the clarifying of our mission, as God's people, our mission is to make disciples, right? How did Jesus make disciples, right? He brought people together and he lived life with them for multiple years, taught them day in and day out and showed them 
right? The right words and the right practices, right? So the, the right words and the right practices. And unfortunately, so often, you know, being a, an evangelist or a missionary has been more of a transactional thing, right? More of a transactional thing. And that's why um, we, we love and support the, the ministry of that, the baboos, right? And Sunshine Ministry, they're bringing kids into, right, the school. And they're, they're discipling them over time, raising them up in certain ways, right? It's important to talk about the right, um, the, the right things, right? What, what God calls us to do and to show people the right actions, right? And that's our mission as people, as God's people, is to go forth and make disciples, right? Go forth and show people God's way, teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded. Right? Don't make up things on, on what you think God wants because that's how you feel, right? Um, you know, know what God's word is and teach people, right? Teach children, teach other people to, to obey God's commandments, right? Then in scripture, we see the fulfillment of the law in Christ's crucifixion, right? John 19, 30 says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit, right? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, right? First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of, Jesus, of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, right? No matter how great your grandfather was, your parents are, your great-grandfather are, if you live a life to follow them, right, it is an empty way of life. The way of life to be fulfilled and redeemed, right, is through Christ. All the good things that you see in your parents or your grandparents or whoever, right, are the ways of God, right? So ultimately, it is through Christ and his work as the lamb without defect, right? As the Passover lamb for us in which we are made right, in which we are reconciled to God. And that can only happen when we recognize who we are, right? That we're sinful, right? That, that, that um, we're in rebellion against God, right? That in our rebellion, we deserve judgment. And then so that we repent and we turn to God and we accept his gift on the cross, right? Hebrews 9, 15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, right? Under the covenant of the law. Right? God gives us this perfect, perfect law so that we know how to live. But all of us, right, all of us have sinned under this perfect law. The law shows us where we have made mistakes and where we are falling short, right? And when we make mistakes and we're in rebellion against God, we turn to Christ. We accept him as our Lord and Savior. We follow him in his ways, and we're ultimately set free in this new covenant, right? In this new covenant under Jesus, his blood makes us pure and clean and holy, right? And then we see Jesus conquering death through his resurrection, right? In Matthew chapter 28, verses five and six, it says, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay, right? Jesus conquers death. Second Timothy 1 verse 10 says, but it, has, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, right? Through our relationship with Jesus Christ, death is conquered, right? Through Christ's work on the cross, death is conquered, and we could be in eternal peace, eternal glory with him, right? The story of scripture, right? 
story of Scripture, the fulfilling of the Old Testament prophecy, the making of a way from God so that we might be reconciled with him, right? And not ultimately pay the consequence of our sin and our mistake, right? And then there's a lot of different uh, teachings and in, 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 uh, theology related to the second coming of Christ, right? The second coming of Christ when all things are made right, right? Hebrews 9, 28 says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him, right? Christ will return, right? He will return and make all things right, have a new heaven and a new earth, right? And these are just five of the uh, Orthodox Christian beliefs pulled from Scripture on the second coming, right? There's people who believe there will be a tribulation, then the second coming, then a millennium, and then the last judgment. And then there's, you know, people who believe that uh, we're in the millennium age of it, and then there'll be a second coming. Any way you cut it, ultimately, Scripture teaches that there's a second coming of Jesus, right? There's a second coming of Christ where all things are made right, right? And based on different texts, people have come up with different ideas. Scripture is very clear. We will not know the day and the time or the hour, right? Scripture is very clear that we are in the last days, right? We've been in the last days since Christ was um, uh, on earth, right? And Christ will return and make all things right. I can talk about these at length if you would like to. Um, and at this point in the game, after studying it for about 15 years, I said, I know Christ is returning. He's going to make all things right. And that's where I hang my hat. The second coming. Another scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Christ will return. We should expectantly, as, as God's people, right, and, and, and hopefully and joyfully want Christ's return and live as if any moment, in any, at any given time, we could be with the Lord. He could return. And even if we live, right, and we pass before Christ's return, we could die at any moment, right? At any given moment, this whole thing, right, this, this body that we walk around with uh, so proudly, right, the, the, the stuff that we have so proudly could be taken away at the drop of a dime through um, sickness, disease, accident, violence, at any given moment. It could be all be taken away. So it's important that we live for Christ and we, um, and we put him first, right, because God's final judgment could happen at any time or any place for any one of us, right? 25, 31, and 32 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as, sh as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats, right? There is the final judgment. There is a final judgment where we will be separated, right? The people who have followed Christ and the people who have not followed Christ, right? We will be separated. Um, I, I love this uh, explanation of the behavior differences between sheep and goats. It says sheep follow their shepherd and trust them to lead them to food, water, and safety. Goats don't follow anyone and forage for whatever they want, right? Goats go their own way, do their own thing right? Goats are stubborn, right? Uh, goats eat anything, right, um, as well. And so there's a difference. Are we sheep where we're following Christ and his ways? Are we trusting in God and his ways uh, uh, for our nourishment, for our good, for our benefit, right, for our life? Or are we following 
ourselves, right? Are we going wherever we want to go and doing whatever we want to do? Right? That's a popular theme today, right? Do what you want. Follow your heart, right? Over and over again, people will tell you these things, right? And it actually is destructive. We shouldn't follow our ways. We shouldn't do what we want, right? We should follow God in his ways. We need to trust in God in his ways. And when we hear things about God and we read the scriptures and his ways are different than our ways, do we submit to his ways? Do we, do we say, do, do we follow and do what the Bible teaches? Or do we say, or, or do we disregard it, right? Do we disregard it as being wrong or incorrect, right? And we are right. Are we a sheep or are we a goat? There is a final judgment, right? There is a final judgment in which we will all face. Nobody knows our hearts, right? Nobody knows our hearts. It's easy to look at somebody and, and, and think they're a goat, right? You don't know where they've come from or what they've experienced or the challenges they have, right? They might be living so much more obediently to God in his ways than you are comparatively, right? So. Each and every one of us needs to assess and, and, and say, who are we following? Who are we living for? Who are we submitting to? Right. Revelation 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged accordingly to what they had done as recorded in the books. Right? Were they goats? Or were they sheep? Were they following Christ? Were they obedient to Christ? Were they living for Christ? Were they covered by the powerful blood of Jesus or not? And then eternal life, right? After final judgment, eternal life. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away, right? When we go to Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, when we recognize our sinful ways and we turn and repent of our sin, sinful ways, right? We are covered by Christ's blood, right? We're no longer judged by our mistakes and our sins, right? But we have eternal life with Lord Jesus. And in closing, I want to, you know, looking at scripture, it's a lot, a lot of different points to cover, a lot of different things to discuss. But if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to just take a moment to help set the vision of our life. We're not living for the here and the now. We're ultimately living for eternity. All things, we will know that all things will pass away, right? All things will pass away. Everything here will be gone. So our mission and our vision and our intention should be to go forth and live for God, make disciples, right, and, and, and help further his kingdom. Anything we do for ourselves, anything we do for our flesh is temporary and inconsequential. It's all for what we do for God and eternity. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for being a God who is so great and wonderful that you, you, you care for us, O oh Lord. You are so much bigger than, than what we could imagine. You know, this story of you interacting with humanity from creation to the cross to your resurrection and then to eternity is unfathomable sometimes. We pray, O oh Lord, um, that we could have the, the, the right perspective and the right hearts, O oh Lord. We are considered blessed to live to be 90 years old. It's only a, a, a small blip in the timeline of, of eternity. So I pray, O oh Lord, that we will not cling to these days and these years so greatly as if they're, they're such a precious thing that it distracts us and becomes an idol, 
so that we don't serve you and follow you. We don't further your kingdom. I pray, O oh Lord, that we will put you first and foremost, and we will recognize your love and care for us. Some things are going to happen today and instantaneously, and some things will take time. Discipleship takes time. Our own personal discipleship and our discipleship of others. So I pray, O oh Lord, that each and every one of us can be in relationship with other people who love you and follow you so that we could be made more into your image and your likeness. And I pray, O oh Lord, that each and every day we will put you first and foremost. In Jesus' name, amen.